Welcome to the video on the stages of a chess game. Now, while the overall goal of chess is to checkmate your opponent's king, there are three defined stages of a game that often you need to go through in order to achieve the end result of checkmating your opponent. Now, of course, not all games last the same amount of moves. Some games may end very quickly after maybe under 10 moves, whereas others may last well into the 80s, 90s, or even 100s sometimes. So while there are three defined stages of chess, keep in mind that a given game can feature one, two, or three of these stages. So without further ado, we will dive into detail and provide five basic strategies for each phase of a chess game. The first phase of a chess game is called the opening. Now, the opening is generally defined as the first 10 to 15 moves in chess. Again, there is no fixed definition, no set number of moves. However, what you should know is the opening, as you get better and better, becomes kind of like a memorized style or sequence of patterns, if you will, where each player plays his or her favorite first few moves to kick off the start of a game. So that's all the opening really is. It's just the first few moves of chess. However, there are some very important things that you should know about the opening to help you get better. The first thing to remember is that you want to control the center. What is the center? All the center means is these eight squares highlighted in green in the middle of the board here. It is important to control these squares because that helps you build your position and hopefully your attack. If you want to relate this to sports, it's the same thing. You know, you want to control the middle of the field or the court. You don't usually want to go from the sides because that gives you less scope to achieve your end result, whatever it may be. Okay, so controlling the center is very important. Number two is you want to develop your pieces as quickly as possible. Don't get carried away making pawn moves all the time because it's important that you get your more powerful pieces involved in the action in the game. And the last three points kind of tie into this idea of wanting to develop our pieces quickly. We, in general, want to develop our king side before our queen side and our knights before our bishops, and castle early. All right, and we will go through some brief examples detailing what all of that means. All right, so let's walk through a very popular opening that is often learned and taught to beginner players. All right, so pawn to e4, often known as the most common opening move in chess, Notice that this pawn is controlling two central squares as well as occupying one of them, along with allowing the bishop and the queen some nice diagonal scope. Black is pretty much going to mirror and copy what white does in this game just to illustrate my overall point. White plays knight to f3, a very common move. So this move develops the knight. On the king side, it attacks this pawn on e5, all right, and it removes one more piece in the way of the king, which we're hoping to castle very, very shortly. Okay, so black protects the pawn on e5 by developing one of his own knights. Okay, so notice black is doing the same thing. He's developing his pieces towards the center. He too is controlling the central squares. Very important. Let's say white goes bishop to c4. So one of the re reasons why I mention it's important that you develop your knights before your bishops is for this reason. The knight is a close range piece. And in the opening, in general, we know where they belong 
before we know where the bishops belong, because the bishop is a long range piece and therefore it has more options. All right. So back here, maybe as white, we would want to develop the bishop to this b5 square, which is perfectly legitimate. And in fact, it, it is a very popular and perfectly good move as well. Okay, whereas if we look at our knights from their starting position, at least in the opening, we really only have two options to begin with, right? One that brings the knight towards the center, and another that brings it away from the center on the rim of the board, on the side here. All right, so logically, I don't think I need to explain too much, but the knight is better off in the middle of the board because it controls more squares and does more damage. Right, so from here on c3, if I just highlight with arrows, it's controlling a lot more squares as opposed to if it were on a3 when it would only control really two squares. Okay, so that's why we want to bring our pieces towards the middle of the board, towards the center, and try to control those eight squares. And because we only have pretty much two reasonable options to even consider with our knights, the choice is pretty obvious. Whereas with our bishops, we have more options. Now again, guys, with all of these rules in this video, these are not definitive, right? Oftentimes, your opponent will do something that causes you to change course and change plans. So you have to adapt accordingly, and you can't just blindly follow these guidelines. But in general, these are what you should be focusing on. Okay, so controlling the center, Knights before bishops, king side before queen side, because what that allows us to do, all right, so notice how both players are continuing to develop their pieces towards the center. It allows us to castle early, right, which gets our king to safety on the side of the board, and then we can continue our central development. Okay, so this is kind of like a picturesque, very basic position. Each side has done a really good job of controlling the center, developing their pieces towards the center of the board. And now, it is around this time that you can begin to feel that the opening is kind of finished, and the game is transitioning into the second phase of the game of chess, which is called, logically, the middle game. Now, the middle game, once again, is kind of an undefined period, right? There are no set number of moves that the middle game can comprise. It occurs after the opening, of course, but that could start on move 5, 10, 15, 20 even sometimes, right? And last all the way to move 40, 50, okay? The middle game is often the trickiest part of chess because this is where the large amount of strategic long-term planning takes place, all right? And this is where the most amount of learning in chess takes place. In the middle game, we have to focus on things such as piece placement. Where are our developed pieces eventually going to end up? Where are they best placed, right? Where are my and my opponent's weaknesses, which can either be weak pawns, pieces, or squares? Who is the attacker and the defender? Are both players attacking? Is one attacking and one defending? Are they attacking on opposite sides of the board? Whose king is safer? And who has better pawn structure? Okay, so all of those things are factors and tips that you should be focused on in the middle game. Okay, so let's take a position, for example, that's a little related to the one that we just saw. Let's take this position, for example. Okay, so in the middle game, we need to start thinking about plans. Okay, and who has the initiative, who is the attacker and defender, and weaknesses in our opponent's position. All right, so in the middle game, as we continue to develop our major pieces, our major pieces, by the way, are our queen and rooks whereas our minor pieces are defined as our bishops and our knights, okay? So as we develop our major pieces, these plans need to come to fruition. So in this case, for example, Black kind of senses that he's the aggressor, and he played this move queen to d7 with the idea 
to try to crash through on white's king side and take this pawn on h3, kind of a mini sacrifice, to really attack and put pressure on white's lone king here on g1. As a result, white sees this plan, does not want to allow it, and defends this from happening. So the middle game is where you really start to see both sides planning against each other, with each move having a purpose, you and your opponent trying to execute your plans and simultaneously stop your opponents at the same time. All right, so playing a couple more moves here. Naturally, another tip is that as we develop our rooks into the game in the middle of the board, we want to put them on open or half open files like what just happened here. Just like the bishop, the rook is a long range piece. So it's best put on a open file. Okay. And then as far as piece placement and weaknesses are concerned, an example here, for instance, is that white identifies that black's pawn on e5 may be a little weak. He also recognizes that he needs to develop this bishop on c1, but can't currently because of this knight on d2 blocking it. So put both concepts together and white play knight to c4 in the game. Very logical, right? So you're adding an attacker to help with pressuring this pawn on c5, and at the same time, you are removing the block from this bishop on e3. So hopefully next move, it can develop, and then white can do the same thing, bringing the rook to the middle of the board, developing it onto an open file. Okay. Now it's important to note, guys, that throughout the three phases of chess, there are two kind of universal constants that, if allowed, you should probably do. All right. So obviously, ultimately, you're trying to checkmate your opponent. Now, if your opponent makes a mistake, in the opening or the middle game, for example, and you have an opportunity to try to checkmate them, you should absolutely do so because you win the game, right? So don't get blinded by trying to follow all these techniques and miss out on a, on a chance to checkmate your opponent early. And the other one is also pretty simple. If your opponent makes a mistake and hangs a piece or a pawn, basically gives you free material, you don't think it's a trap, you probably should take it because that just is helping you get closer to winning the game. So for example, in this position, if your opponent doesn't see or ignores the fact that you now have two pieces or two knights in this case, attacking the pawn on E5 compared to black's lone defender. All right. And let's say he just makes a random move like pawn to A6. Okay. Although yes, we certainly want to develop our bishop on E3 to bring our pieces to the middle of the board, a free pawn is a free pawn, right? So in this case, you know, don't be afraid to take the free material when you can. That's an important note. Okay, so the opening, you know, lasts about 10 to 15 moves. The middle game takes place after that. And the final phase of the game, if the game ends up lasting that long, is called the end game. All right. So the end game in this case, while it occurs after the middle game, there is a way to define an end game technically. The end game occurs whenever both queens are off the board, basically traded, exchanged, captured, whatever. All right. So that signifies an end game when the queens are no longer present. Okay. So the end game has some characteristics as well. There are, again, five points that you guys should be aware of to pay attention to if your game reaches a position like this, for example. All right, so number one is material becomes increasingly important, right? So as fewer and fewer pieces and pawns remain on the board, whoever has more towards the end of the game that advantage becomes magnified, right? So take this position for an example. White has three pawns to black's two. 
Now, if there were tons of pieces on the board still, this one pawn advantage for white would not be as deadly, whereas now this is a completely winning game. Which brings me to my second point. In the end game, past pawns are very, very important, especially those on the outside files. So why is this? Well, remember, as mentioned in a previous video, when one of your pawns reaches the final rank of a chessboard, you get a chance to make that pawn into a queen, right? So if you're able to get your pawn to the other side, that immediately translates into a queen advantage for you. So if you have more pawns than your opponent and there are no other pieces on the board, this becomes a huge advantage that's often decisive. All right. Combine that with the fact that if they're on the outer edges of the board, it makes a piece like a lone king, for example, overworked because it can't cover both sides of the board at once because it's a very short range piece. All right. So that probably makes sense. And the way to win positions like this is you just stretch the king by advancing on both sides of the board. So, for example, White plays pawn to h5 to create the second pass pawn. And then whichever side the black king moves to, white is going to advance the pawn on the other side of the board. And eventually, it's going to have to pick a side, and then you just go the other direction. And eventually, one of these pawns is going to queen. Okay, so a couple other points that you should be aware of in the endgame. Because queens are no longer on the board, Use the king as an attacking piece. It's very hard to get checkmated when the queens are off the board, because it's the most powerful piece in the game. So don't forget about the king in the endgame, because you can use it to your advantage to contribute to the action. Okay? So the king can be used as a powerful piece. Alright? Also, the concept of activity. It is very important that your pieces remain active in the endgame, especially long-range pieces such as rooks and bishops. All right, so to give you an example of this, take this position for an example. Now, without getting too complicated, I'm just going to show you how this game ended. White recognized the power of the activity of his rook, right, where it's controlling this crucial 7th rank, along with the entire h-file, the fact that his king position was better than his opponent's, the fact that he had a passed pawn far advanced down the board, combine all that together, and watch what happened. Okay, so... White walks the king to a very powerful square. And in conjunction with his active rook and his passed pawn that's about to queen, black is about to be checkmated. Okay, for example, either by the rook moving up one square to h8, which would be checkmate, or something like this with g7 and g8 getting a new queen. Okay, so pay attention to activity and king placement and pass pawns in the endgame. Very, very important. Last endgame position that I'll show you, this is a classic situation. Again, all I want to point out is notice how the kings are involved in the game, all right? And that the side that's going to win this game is going to be the one that's up in material, all right? So if you do a little count, you'll notice that white is ahead a bishop in exchange for one pawn. All right, so white is, is winning, along with the fact that this pawn on d5 is going to be captured very shortly, allowing this pawn on d4 to hopefully get a new queen. All right, so those are some endgame tips. Okay. To wrap up, I'll give one more middle game and opening example. Okay, so looking at this position, white played bishop to h6. Okay, so this move is important because white is continuing the development 
it found a weak square. So this is the best place for the bishop to go. It's also attacking the rook on f8, of course. All right. And after the rook moves, white just continues with developing the major pieces. Again, bringing the rooks to the middle of the board. Okay. And then once all the pieces have been developed, it is up to white now to improve the piece placement. So just because you develop the piece doesn't mean they have to stay there. Once they're developed, you have to think about, okay, where are they best placed? Okay. And white in this case realized, as an example, that, hey, this queen on e2 would be really nicely placed on c3, where it can do some damage on the diagonal against black's king. So what white did was simply walk the queen over to c3. Okay, so those are the type of plans that you are going to be making in the middle game. Okay. Lastly, as far as just showing another kind of opening example, in this situation, notice how, again, both sides are controlling the center of the board. All right pieces are being developed king side before queen side knights before bishops and castling early if you follow those rules you normally will get out of the opening unscathed okay guys so once again remember while the opening, middle game, and the end game are the three phases of chess, not all of your games are going to go through each of these phases. The game may end in a very early stage. Also remember that while you should use the tips given in this video to help you through those three phases, don't lose sight of the end goal of chess, right? If you're able to checkmate your opponent, or at least try to, go ahead and do so. And of course, if there is a hanging free piece for the taking, and it's not a trap, then that's almost always a good idea to follow through and capture that piece. Thank you for watching, and feel free to practice with the examples from this video. Thank you.